Hello, my name is Phil Kern. I'm the Central Washington History's Board Vice President and Coordinator of the Speaker Series. Here are some upcoming announcements. We are excited to announce that our museums will open by appointment only on Tuesday, April 6th. See our website, centerforwashingtonhistory.org, for additional information. It's membership renewal time. Members of Center for Washington History should be looking for membership renewal letters coming in the mail. For those who are not members and would like to be, go to our website, centerforwashingtonhistory.org, and consider joining. There are many different levels of membership, and we encourage you to join and support this outstanding organization. The Summer Youth Program is moving forward. Our plans are to offer our summer workshops while following the state of Ohio's safety guidelines. The dates set for our summer youth program are June 15th, 17th, 18th, and the 25th. Check out the website for updates. The Ghost Walk on Main is scheduled for Thursday, October 14th, and is geared for adults. It is a fun evening of murder, mayhem, and mystery. Participants will be taking a walking tour with great storytelling and dramas. We'll learn all about the authentic ghostly aspects of our historic community. Check our website for updates on all our programs and events. Now I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker, Jim Charters, who is a volunteer at the Caroline Historical Association and his topic is John H. Patterson. John H. Patterson was born in Dayton in 1844. His grandfather, Robert Patterson, moved to Dayton when he lost all of the land that he owned. The land I'm referring to consisted of approximately half of Lexington, Kentucky. Robert Patterson fought in the Revolutionary War. He co-founded Lexington and Cincinnati. He was a friend of Daniel Boone, and he knew Patrick Henry. In Dayton, he acquired 2,417 acres of land about a mile south of the settlement, and he called his property the Rubicon Farm. Now, his youngest son, Jefferson, he had 11 children, and he named his seventh child John Henry. John H. Patterson grew up on the Rubicon Farm. He graduated from high school. He uh, served briefly and without incident in the Union Army, and then uh, went off to college where he acquired his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth and a lifelong disdain for college men. That lifelong disdain for higher education came about as a result of the fact that he returned to Dayton with diploma in hand, but unable to find a job. His diploma, actually disqualified him for physical labor, and his lack of experience disqualified him from everything else. But eventually, he found a job as a toll collector on the Miami Erie Canal in Dayton. Now, this was a mindless job that soon exhausted his limited capacity for boredom. So he put a sign outside the building that said, Coal for Sale. Now, he really didn't have any coal for sale, but he'd take orders for coal, mark it up, and pass it along to the local coal yard. When the coal yard went up for sale, he and his older brother Stephen borrowed $250, and they bought the coal yard. Now, at age 25, young Mr. Patterson realized that there's really no reason why anybody should buy his coal. Coal is coal. So, lacking reasons, he created some. In those days, customers uh, frequently complained about the fact that they weren't getting the number of shipments that they were paying for. So, Patterson came up with a color-coded system of receipts that he gave to his illiterate delivery men. Other customers complained that they weren't getting the quantity of coal that they were paying for. 
Patterson offered to pay the fee for weighing the coal at the public scale. Now in those days, coal was delivered in broken down wagons pulled by broken down horses. Patterson delivered his coal in brightly colored wagons with a sign on the side that said Patterson and Company. John H. Patterson was learning the value of merchandising and becoming quite good at it. In about three years, he had half the coal business in Dayton. Now to protect his investment, he bought three coal mines in Southern Ohio near Colton. And on that property was a, um, a miner's supply store. Now the miner's supply store was doing pretty good business, about $48,000 a year. But Patterson, after three years, had lost $3,000 and was $16,000 in debt. He offered the uh, store to anybody free of charge if they would just assume the uh, debt. He found no takers. The reason he was losing money is because his clerks were stealing from him. And this was a common problem back then. In fact, it was called an unsolvable retail problem. It was uh, very easy to do. If a clerk needed to make change, he would just put his hand in a box, pull out the money, and make the change. There was no receipt and no accountability. One store owner was asked, how does your employee afford such a beautiful diamond ring? And the store owner said, well, he stole from me until he could afford to buy one. And the man says, well, why don't you fire him? And the owner said, it's better to have an employee that already has a diamond ring than to hire one who doesn't, who will steal until he can get one as well. Necessity is the mother of invention. And there was another gentleman in Dayton who was having the same problem with employee theft. His name was James Riddy, and he owned a saloon at 123 South Jefferson Street called the Pony House. Maybe to just get away from all of it for a while, he decided to take a voyage in 1878. And on the ship, he decided to visit the engine room. And there he saw the mechanism that counted the rotation of the ship's propeller, and he had an idea. He thought he could adapt this principle to counting receipts. When he returned to Dayton, he teamed up with his machinist brother, John, and together they designed and built the world's first cash register. Now less than oh, a dozen of these contraptions were in use when John Patterson saw an advertisement for one and he bought two of them sight unseen. He took them to Colton, he fired all of his employees there, hired new ones and trained them on how to use the cash register. In six months he was showing a $5,000 profit. But then he bit off more than he could chew. He had three coal mines. He had a coal distributorship. And what he decided to do was buy a rail line to tie the two together. Well, after a while, he wrote off over half of the $40,000 investment. It was now time to look for a new venture. And his eye fell upon the cash register. He decided in 1884 to pluck down $6,500 and purchase controlling interest in the National Manufacturing Company, which held the patent to Riddy's invention. He got excited and he, uh, he went to the Dayton Club and mentioned his purchase. Well, they laughed at him. They said the product is defective, the credit is very poor, and the building is located in a slum. Well, this was all news to Patterson because he hadn't even bothered to visit the place before he bought it. Well, he offered the previous owner $100. If he would take the company back, no questions asked. The answer was no. He upped it to $500. Again, the answer was no. Then he offered $2,000, almost a third of what he paid 
for the uh, patent if he would take it back. The response he got shook him up. He was told by the previous owner, I wouldn't take this company back if you gave it to me. Well, now Patterson had a decision to make. Uh, does he try to make it work or does he just give up? He decided to try and make it work. He started by renaming the National Manufacturing Company, the National Cash Register Company. And he operated out of rented buildings. Now the 13 employees that he inherited were producing about 30 cash registers a month. And that was more registers than all of America thought they needed. So lacking a need, he created some. He could not afford to hire salesmen. So he brought in commission agents and they provided him with the names of 5,000 prospective buyers. Patterson came up with 18 kinds of advertising and he sent out one ad every week by mail, six days a week for three weeks. This was the first example of direct mail advertising. Well, just like today, not everybody appreciated direct mail advertising. In fact, one envelope came back that somebody had scribbled on it. Please, for heaven's sakes, let up. What have we ever done to you? Patterson had a product that he believed in. What he needed were customers. He found his answer, as sometimes desperate men do, in a bar. Story goes, a man walked into a bar and ordered a shot of whiskey, drank the whiskey down, put his 50 cents on the counter and walked out. As he's walking out the door, the bartender scoops up the 50 cents, puts it in his pocket. And as he does that, he notices that the owner is watching him. Without batting an eye, he says, Look at the nerve of that guy. Can't afford to pay for his drink. Gives me a 50 cent tip. Well, bar owners, saloon keepers, that was Patterson's first target market. They and others like him were actually concerned about the fact that the dollars of the less than sober were finding their way into the pockets of the less than honest. This was not an easy sale bartenders considered the cash register to be a thief catcher that impugned their honesty or narrowed their leeway for transgression. And when anything came from NCR in an envelope, they'd immediately throw it in the trash can. If an NCR representative came into the bar, he was immediately escorted out the back into the alley. Well, Patterson took countermeasures. He designed a small three key model cash register that could be concealed in a briefcase, which could be carried in by the salesman who could get around the bartender and go to the owner and demonstrate the product. Well, sales started picking up. The year they, the company began, 1884, they were selling 359 cash registers. In four years, in 1888, they were selling more cash registers than the factory could make. We teach through the eye. That was a saying that Patterson really appreciated. He really liked that. We teach through the eye. He said 87% of everything we learn, we learn through the eye. Where he came up with the 87%, nobody knows. Maybe he made it up. He said no ad is large enough to contain two ideas. He would take blank newspaper sheets and he'd write an idea on it, crumble it up, throw it away. On the next sheet, he'd write another idea, crumble it up and throw it away. He had one of his assistants stitch these blank sheets together, put it on an easel for easy display. And this became the world's first flip chart. Patterson claimed that he never had an original idea. He said he would collect ideas from a variety of different people, 
shuffle them like a deck of cards and discard those that didn't meet the need he was looking for at that particular moment. Later on, he did the same with executives. He would hire the brightest minds, he would trade them, and sometimes discard them for no real good reason. Sometimes because they argued with him. Sometimes because he was bored and sometimes just for practice. Now, salesmen at the time thought selling was done with charm and wit. A sale was a slap on the back, a fresh joke, and a stale cigar when the deal was done. Well, Patterson wanted to change this idea. He wanted his salesman to be professional. It took him almost a decade to come out with the true corporate executive who was selling his product. He wanted them to be clean, well-informed when selling the product, and well-dressed. He hired the head valet at the Waldorf Astoria to teach him how to dress. He wanted them to get the hayseed off of them. He actually sent young promising salesmen to New York City to buy suits at the company's expense. He wanted them to develop a style, a style that would cost money to keep up, money that they could make by selling more cash registers. Patterson had had it with born salesmen. It was time to grow his own. And in 1894, he started the first professional sales training program. He assigned territories for his salesmen, gave them a quota, and if they met the quota, they could attend the annual meeting at headquarters. Well, at one such meeting, the salesmen that had made their quotas came in and they had lunch at a building that was uh, scheduled to be demolished. Well, after lunch, they went their separate ways, and Patterson ordered his ground crew to totally demolish that building. He didn't want any remnants of it left. They uh, put sod over the area where the building had previously stood. Well, the next day at lunch, the salesmen came back, and they started scratching their heads and questioning whether or not they were there the day before. Where is the building? Well, Patterson had two points to make. One, anything is possible. And two, anything could be gotten rid of, including salesmen that don't make their quota. Industrialism had built the machine and then made machine like those who tended it. Daniel Rogers. The early days at NCR, the work was pure drudgery. This drudgery turned into an act of arson. In 1894, a shipment of $50,000 worth of cash registers were returned from England as defective. The problem, a disgruntled employee had poured acid into the mechanism. Well, Patterson immediately moved his office to the factory floor to find out what the problem was. And it was an epiphany. He realized that the workers really didn't have any heart in their job. It didn't make any difference to them whether they made a good product or a bad product. In the ensuing months, a wage increase was granted. Dirt and debris were removed. Dangerous equipment was shielded. Fans installed to uh, draw off metal dust of grinding. Lockers were set up for all workers. Free showers followed lockers. A medical dispensary and dental unit followed. Patterson opened a company cafeteria serving hot lunches for a nickel. He had a study made of the work hours lost due to colds during the rainy season. Women workers heading home in rainstorms were had into company umbrella to be returned in the morning. Women were also let off 15 minutes earlier than the men so that they could find a seat on the streetcar. Patterson hired Frank Andrews to build a series of glass factories. 
NCR established a night school, a free lending library, a 2,000-seat schoolhouse auditorium was built where lectures, movies, slideshows, and concerts were presented each noon hour. To stimulate ambition, Patterson instituted one of the earliest of suggestion systems with cash prizes to those who contributed useful ideas to the company. By 1899, NCR was operating Dayton's first kindergarten, Sunday school, a saving bank for children, playgrounds, cooking and sewing classes for the girls and women, girls and boys clubs, a progressive club for men, and an advanced club for women. Patterson also established a 300-acre employee park. By the close of the century, Patterson's employees were among the best treated in America, well-paid, tolling in safe conditions, and with an extensive list of benefits to choose from. Patterson believed in women's rights, and he established the Women's Century Club, the first woman lawyer employed by a major corporation. Her name was Amy Atten. She provided the leadership that made it successful. Patterson also financed the construction of a facility that was located near the old Patterson homestead. And in this facility, young women could live and they didn't have to pay the high expenses that one would normally pay in a country club. In fact, the annual dues for these women was $1 a year. Young women coming to Dayton for employment at NCR could find a safe and a clean environment. In 1912, a telegram from John H. Patterson to Edward Deeds said, women's suffrage is right and in the end must win. The same year, Patterson sent a telegram to the Women's Suffrage Association. Women's suffrage is America's greatest opportunity for moral, mental, physical, financial, and social betterment. That same year, Patterson wrote out a check for $4,800 to the uh, Women's Suffrage Association of Dayton and Montgomery County. And he also offered office space at the Schwinn Building, which uh, the uh, Moraine Embassy Hotel was located on South Ludlow Street. In 1914, at the onset of World War I, Women's Suffrage program was kind of diverted. The women were spending their time assisting the military in any way that they could. The women didn't think it was right to ask uh, the, uh, the mothers to uh, get involved in the suffrage movement when their sons were dying overseas. Well, this caught the attention of President Woodrow Wilson. And September the 30th, 1918, he went before the Senate and asked them to please pass the 19th Amendment, which would give women the right to vote. Now, Patterson really encouraged women's suffrage, but he had another side as well. As I mentioned, he would hire the brightest minds and he would train them and then frequently fire them for no particular good reason at all. One executive coming back from a business trip found his desk and his chair in the front lawn of NCR on fire. It is said that perhaps this is where the saying, you're fired, came from. Another executive uh, was so upset with being fired, he told Patterson he was going to start a company larger than he ever had. And that's exactly what Tom Watson did when he was fired from NCR and started IBM. Now, Patterson hated competition, and he'd do whatever he could to cut competition. In fact, he went so far as to make a product that looked like a competitive model designed to fail. And when he failed, 
his salesman would go in and trade it out for an NCR model. Now, the federal government frowned on this. This violated the Sherman Antitrust Act. And Judge Hallister sentenced Patterson to a year in jail and $5,000 fine. Patterson needed either a reversal on appeal or an act of God. He got an act of God. On Easter Sunday, 1913, it started raining. Patterson, at 6.45 a.m. on Monday, held an emergency meeting with his executives and said, gentlemen, Dayton is going to be flooded. He ordered his carpentry crew to start building rescue boats. He ordered his commissary to start making thousands of loaves of bread and hundreds of gallons of soup. He ordered men to ride on horseback south of town to pick up supplies. He uh, ordered others to look for bedding and blankets that could be used. At seven o'clock, the meeting was over and everybody had a job to do. In 15 minutes, Patterson converted his company over to uh, address a crisis that really hadn't begun yet. But at 7 a.m., the levees broke. And before the week is over, over 20 feet of water found itself in downtown Dayton, Ohio. These NCR rowboats were made one every eight minutes, and they made 275 of these rowboats. And as soon as they were ready, they were put out into the water to rescue people. Now these rowboats consume 50 50,000 board feet of NCR lumber. And NCR never got a penny reimbursed for any of this, and there was no tax deduction. Now those rescued in the NCR boats were brought back to NCR headquarters, and they were given uh, dry clothes, blankets, food, water, cots to sleep on, medical attention if it was needed. Word got out as to what Patterson was doing, and uh, letters were sent to Woodrow Wilson asking for a presidential pardon. Well, Wilson got the information and, in fact, issued a pardon for John H. Patterson. He never spent a moment in jail. John H. Patterson had saved Dayton, Ohio. In 1921, Patterson stepped down as a uh, direct manager of NCR and assumed a little used title at the time of chairman of the board. The following year, in 1922, on a train just east of Philadelphia, John H. Patterson had a heart attack and he died. John H. Patterson was truly one of Dayton's great leaders, and he was buried at Woodland Cemetery in Dayton, Ohio.